Sertraline is an antidepressant in the SSRI class. It was one of the first SSRIs to enter the market, and it remains a very popular psychiatric medication. Along with being used for depression, it is also used for OCD, anxiety, and other conditions. As always, there will be more information and links to references on the drugclassroom.com, which you can find using the link below. The primary positive effects include depression reduction, mood improvement, and anxiety reduction. Among the potential negatives are nausea, headache, diarrhea, sexual dysfunction, insomnia, dry mouth, drowsiness, dizziness, tremor, and fatigue. Efficacy has been demonstrated in depression, dysthymia, OCD, social anxiety, panic disorder, PTSD, premature ejaculation, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's also sometimes used in eating disorders. As with other psychiatric medications, sertraline isn't going to be effective for everyone. It has a similar efficacy to other SSRIs, SNRIs, and TCAs in the treatment of depression. There are some trends in favor of its efficacy relative to other common antidepressants, so it may be a good first-line treatment. It's specifically used as a first-line treatment in cases of depression where someone has cardiovascular disease. Although it does work in the long term for many people, the greatest evidence of efficacy is seen over a period of months. It appears relapse rates increase over time. Even if treatment is continued in someone who has responded to the drug, it might not permanently keep major depression from returning. For minors, the primary indication is an OCD, where it has been shown to be effective. It might be effective in other disorders like depression and anxiety. Sertraline can be ineffective and potentially negative for depression and anxiety symptoms when treatment first begins. Some benefit is often noticed after the first week and the efficacy builds over the following three to eight weeks. The primary negatives in medical settings are sexual dysfunction, drowsiness, dizziness, headache, increased sweating, dry mouth, agitation, and insomnia. Sexual dysfunction is one of the main complaints with sertraline and other SSRIs. Patients may experience decreased libido, delayed ejaculation, and decreased pleasure. Sexual dysfunction appears to be less significant with sertraline compared to paroxetine, citalopram, and venlafaxine, though it's higher than with mirtazapine. For other negatives, it may cause less constipation, fatigue, and weight gain than paroxetine, while the incidence of diarrhea is greater. Sertraline is an isomer of a tametraline derivative. It primarily functions as a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Some minor dopamine reuptake inhibition does exist and is of unclear clinical relevance. How SSRIs provide their beneficial effects still isn't understood. It's currently believed the effects come from something more complex than the drug's initial serotonin uptake inhibition. There's an immediate impact on serotonin activity, yet it can take four weeks or more for the full benefits to emerge. I'll briefly discuss a few possibilities possibilities, but it should be noted that more research is definitely needed. An overarching view is that adaptations in the brain are responsible. This could mean desensitization of 5-HT1A autoreceptors, which could facilitate greater serotonin activity. BDNF could also be playing a role. BDNF seems to increase with sertraline, and lower basal levels of BDNF can be seen in depression. Along with raising BDNF, there are other possible factors that contribute to the support and growth of neurons and synapses. As such, the drug might be providing its benefit at least partly through neurogenesis. There's a high serotonin hypothesis that's based around depression actually being an energetically expensive state associated with higher serotonin activity. This model suggests initial SSRI effects are neutral or negative, but prolonged use can actually provide benefits by altering serotonergic activity and reducing glutamatergic activity. Another way of looking at the effects involves an impact of SSRI on low-level information processing. There's evidence that they could move the processing towards positive versus negative associations. This kind of impact on processing enables a relearning process that can take weeks to become clearly beneficial. In 1977, Kenneth Koh, a chemist in the Pfizer Pharmacology Department, was looking at structural features of potent and relatively selective uptake inhibitors. He worked with another Pfizer employee, Willard Welch, to have a set of tametraline derivatives synthesized. Those derivatives were tested, and sertraline was picked out from the group due to its selective and potent nature. The drug was patented in 1979. In vitro and in vivo studies were carried out in the 1980s. They showed sertraline was an effective 
serotonin uptake blocker in rats. The tests also confirmed it was quite selective for serotonin. Studies in humans found it was well tolerated even up to 400 milligrams and exhibited fewer side effects than TCAs. It was approved in the UK in 1990. The FDA approved sertraline under the name Zoloft in 1991 and it was officially launched in February 1992. Between the 1990s and 2000s, the drug was investigated and adopted for many uses. Early in its history, it was being used alongside just a few other SSRIs, fluoxetine, peroxetine, and fluvoxamine. Many health professionals were largely unaware of some of the problematic aspects of SSRIs, particularly their withdrawal effects. This meant patients were also often unaware of exactly how sertraline could impact their lives, both on and off the drug. Knowledge about the withdrawal effects has grown over time, but adequate info still may not be provided to patients. Around 2005, the drug was generating revenue of two to three billion dollars annually. In 2013, it was the most popular antidepressant in the US and the second biggest psychiatric medication. There were about 40 million prescriptions. The drug is usually started at 25 to 50 milligrams per day. From there, dose adjustments can be made based on treatment response, generally ending with a maintenance dose of 50 to 200 milligrams per day. Sertraline is unscheduled in the U.S., though it's a prescription-only substance. It is often a prescription-only drug in other countries. Sertraline has historically been viewed as largely safe in overdose. Some of the symptoms include drowsiness, tachycardia, tremor, nausea, and vomiting. Even up to a few thousand milligrams has been largely non-problematic. While it's possible to have a severely dangerous response just from sertraline, most deaths involve combinations. In medical settings, most of the severe adverse effects are rare. There are some reports of abnormal bleeding, tremor, and syncope. Sertraline may also increase panic attacks and anxiety in some people though this could be followed by a therapeutic anxiolytic effect. When there are negative effects, they're more along the lines of nausea, insomnia, sweating, and sexual dysfunction. There are some liver health concerns for a very small group of patients. It normally has no or very minimal effect on the liver, but a few reports exist of hepatotoxicity. In general, if you have any significant negative effects, you should notify your prescribing physician. Serotonin syndrome is one of the concerns with sertraline. Although it could could potentially occur with sertraline itself, generally with a very large overdose, it's most often a concern when another serotonergic drug is used. This means, for example, that it should not be used with MAOIs. Serotonin syndrome can be deadly, but most cases treated at a medical center resolve in about 24 hours. Withdrawal does exist with sertraline. It doesn't occur for everyone, but a significant portion do experience some form of withdrawal. Usually the symptoms appear within a few days of stopping or reducing your dose and they're relatively mild. They then resolve between one day and a few weeks after the onset. A common duration of symptoms is around five to eight days. Some of the effects include flu-like symptoms, insomnia, decreased concentration, irritability, headache, dizziness, and nausea. Another issue is electric shock sensations that vary in intensity. They can sometimes impair normal functioning, such as by affecting walking and driving. Those sensations don't occur in all patients. Prolonged symptoms lasting more than six weeks are rare, but they've occasionally been reported. Those include disturbed mood, depression, mood swings, irritability, insomnia, anxiety, impaired concentration, and impaired memory. These issues can be distinct from the patient's original condition. It's unclear why the majority of people experience temporary symptoms, while some people report prolonged issues lasting months or years. Tapering is recommended. A lot of people still report symptoms after they fully end their use, but tapering is a good strategy to potentially reduce the severity of symptoms. Greater risk of suicidal thoughts and behavior is one of the potential concerns with SSRIs that has received a lot of attention. Most of the data suggests there's a very low risk of suicidal activity, but that doesn't mean it never occurs. A sudden onset of aggression and suicidal ideation is possible. If you have symptoms of that sort or know someone who does, the physician should be contacted. Monitoring a patient is especially important during the first one to two months. There's some evidence that the risk varies by age. The suicide risk may be unaffected or lower over the age of 24, while it could be unaffected or slightly higher for younger people. The risk may also vary to some extent between antidepressants, with sertraline generally considered low risk. Some of the risky combinations include MAOIs, dextromethorphan, and tramadol.
If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. In order for the drug classroom to provide more education, support is necessary. And the best way to support is through Patreon at patreon.com slash the drug classroom. You can also contribute through PayPal or Bitcoin. You can reach me on Twitter at Seth A. Fitzgerald and via email at seth at the drug classroom.com. More information and links to references can be found on the TDC website using the link below.